This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. She's amazing. Like, I, it blows my mind how her, her artwork is just, I, every, every time I see a piece, I, I don't have to see that it's hers. I, I know it's hers because she's so amazing at what she does. I did meet my friend Lori Beasy for the first time. Uh, there was a, at that time a women's community center in Eau Claire. I'd been one of the people who helped to pull that together. Lori moved to town and Lori being Lori immediately found the women's community center and um, that's how we met. It turned out we were neighbors and we uh, both had children and we just hit it off. I got to know her through opening up my own business family and I's own business and um, just fell in love with her she was just a she was a great lady everybody there always liked her was always welcomed by her smile for me I, when I, I lived here back in the 80s I went to high school and we'd go to grocery stores and go around town and I would run into people I knew all the time and later after leaving town and coming back I realized that it, roles had changed. We couldn't go to the grocery store, or we couldn't go to the library without a five, ten minute conversation with people I really didn't know, but were obviously very interested in Lori, and I felt a certain amount of pride in her that way. I think one of the greatest things that Lori did is that she brought different networks of people together. I mean, like, I have a circle of friends you know, and Lori had a circle of friends and she brought our circles together. The, the easiest, nicest, most beautiful person I think I've met next to my wife, uh, very easily. Uh, smile would light up a room, her voice would bring laughter and happiness to everybody around her. Hello, my name's Jack Corey. For 31 years, I was a police officer in the city of Eau Claire until I retired. One of the fun things about being a police officer in a community like Eau Claire is you get to meet uh, unique, strange, uh, creative people that, uh, that catch your eye. And you see them around and you, and you like to get to know them, but uh, sometimes you don't. I mean, you're the beat cop and uh, you don't necessarily go up and just talk to some of these folks. Well, during my career, one of those people I met was Lori Beasy. Never really got a chance to talk to her until in true Lori fashion, uh, probably over a cup of coffee at a local downtown coffee shop. She never let the stereotype, the typical stereotype of beat cop get in the way and she probably initiated a conversation and uh, Lori was Lori and you just got to know her and she let you in. During my career uh, I was privileged to know her and was privileged to have her let me into her world. Back in March of this year, I um, had an opportunity to go to Lori's home. She let us in to talk with her. It was very evident, it was known to her. She was aware of the fact that the cancer that was running through her was about to take her. And, but she graciously allowed us to come in and talk with her. And the conversation was very typical Lori. Welcome, Lori, <laughs> or thanks for letting us and for welcoming oh, us in. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I told you I like being on TV, so this is fun for me. Okay, good. You were not from Eau Claire. No. So how, how does Lori Beasy get to be Lori Beasy and come to Eau Claire? Well, I traveled around a great deal. Um, I went to 17 schools by the time I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was always a new kid in school and getting ready to move. Uh, my father was in the military, and so we traveled a lot. And uh, so I enjoyed it. I love to travel now. I mean, I've been pretty much around the world, and that's been fun. I've absolutely enjoyed, loved it. And I raised a daughter who liked to do the same thing. So I got to follow her around the world, too. So that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So. What branch was your father in? He was in the Army. Army, okay. Mm -hmm. So a lot of bases in. In the States, or did you do international travel? We did international travel. Uh, first, first place that I was old enough to remember where I was was in Salzburg, Austria. And my father was in charge of misplaced people there. First, first shiploaded dependents that came in after the war to Europe. And uh, 
my father took people out of the concentration camps and put them in hotels. And one of the interesting stories about that is that uh, when they put them in the hotel, when they would go up in the morning to wake them up, they would find them all in one room because they had been cuddling for any kind of security or warmth that they could get for so long that they couldn't separate. And so that lady started working on that. My mother and lots of other women would, would go in and hang out with the women and try to you know, and they all, most all of them spoke Yiddish, of course, and mm -hmm. how many people do you know that speak Yiddish? So it was quite a trial, I suppose, but, and I lived there with, in a great big huge mansion with between 10 and 20 people that had just been left out of uh, concentration camps, and so, and they spoke all kinds of languages. And from there we came back to the United States, and I lived in Oklahoma for a little while, and then, after Oklahoma, we went to Alabama for a couple of years, and then we went to Colorado, and then we went to, back to Alabama, then back to Colorado. <laughs> it, it goes and goes and goes. I mean, right. I but lived most of the time in Colorado until I went to art school in Denver, and then I went out on my own. Okay, art uh, school, as in? We, I mean, everybody in Eau Claire knows you as uh, stained glass art. Uh, is that what? Is that where you started, or? Well, no. I was a commercial illustrator for years and did lots of lots of things, um, and lived all over the country doing that too. And when I got to Houston, Texas, when I was living there, uh, there weren't very many jobs, so I decided to create one. So I talked the manpower big manpower center into hot, into advertising that they had a commercial artist one time and if nobody called then I would know I was wrong. They got 13 calls right away so I had all the work I could handle and it was perfect because I had little kids. And mm -hmm. So that was a really interest. that was an interesting job because like one week I'd doing class rings and the next week I would be doing lettering on oil field negatives for a place in Venezuela. So it was just very, very, it was very fun because it was so varied. But, uh, and then uh, moved out to Oregon, lived in Oregon for a few years and I worked at the university there. And uh, then we came here. How? How do you make it from Oregon to Montclair? We came here blind, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, were, we just liked to move, evidently, and we didn't know whether to go to um, Colorado, which is what's my home, my home state, or what I had always felt that way until here. And um, we were going to live in either Durango, Colorado, which would have been very cool, where we should, probably should have gone. <laughs> I mean, I love Eau Claire now, but it's been, it was hard. Mm -hmm. I spent time in Africa with my daughter when she was in the Peace Corps. I would go back, if my daughter was with me, <laughs> in a flash. Uh, another place that I would absolutely go back to is um, on this little island that's the closest island to Bali. It's called Gili Trawanga. And there's no motorized vehicle of any kind on this. And people that, you know, are regular walkers can walk around the whole island in just three hours. And the, and I I went with my daughter and a, and a friend and they just wanted to lay in the sun and I like to go meet the people of course. And so they just drink beer all day and sit in the sun and I'd go talk to the people that were cleaning up the and met this one man, this is I think this is a wonderful story. I met this one named Tony and he cleaned the rooms and carried the luggage. And, and Tony, one of the first things that Tony said to me is, I have a dream. Well, you can't let a young man say, I have a dream, and not know about what the dream is, right? It's just have to know. And he said, well, I'm going to build a house. He said, I need, he said, I now have 10 pieces of wood, 
and my whole dog, and I own two its of land, and one it is about the size of this living room. And he said, now I need to get the rest of the wood, and I'm going to build a one room, and I'm, I'm going to rent that out till I have enough money to build a three room. Then I will rent the three room out, and I will live in the one room. And I said, so what are you, what's going to happen when you have a wife and some children? He said, we will live in the three-room house then, and we will rent the one room out. And so when he left, my friend and I each gave him $100, which finished his house. Mm -hmm. So now I get pictures, and he has a little boy now. And so, I mean, he's all the pictures almost are of this little boy or him lounging somewhere, which I never saw him lounge the whole time I was at, this, <laughs> at their place. But So I don't know whether he's still cleaning the rooms or not, but anyway, so he, his dreams came, came true. And it's amazing, you know, what $100 can do. It's the way I usually feel when you give money to large charities, you know, when you work hard for your money, you want it to do something. Mm -hmm. So, make a difference. Mm -hmm. no. Well, at, at first I, I struggled finding a medium, and I, and, and I struggled with having such great artists around me. You know, having, you know, my mother, you know, could just sketch something on a notepad, and it would be beautiful. And I'd just be like, you know, I can't do that, <laughs> you know, and it was, as far as the effect she had on that, it was more of a nurturing understanding that you have to find your outlet. You can't, you can't just take what you want. You know, it's kind of a mutual choosing, the outlet chooses you type thing. And, and for me, the big breakthrough, for me as far as an artist was going, was when I, when I had a, a, my brain embolism, which caused a stroke, and I lost sort of a motor control and my fine motor control and I was able to adopt a more of a freedom to my art and and it re released within me the ability to just express myself in ways that I couldn't or didn't realize that that was what artists were doing they weren't making something look like something they were expressing themselves so that's the, the, the nurturing and the freeing was of my of that dogma I was putting myself under Lori really pushed forward and said you know she encouraged me in the, in the direction I was going because she loved it and like told me she said she just stare at it for hours and just smile and, and that for me was the motivation to keep on becoming and today being able to call myself an artist even right and really roughly around the time of uh, Destiny Artworks that I had probably my biggest push towards art, one of them. And that's when I got to know <coughs> Lori and several, several other people uh, in this town that were either, you know, nationwide artists, worldwide artists, or very popular local artists. And um, I learned a lot from them. She always was like putting out a bowl of cream for somebody to like come up to her porch and like, you know, that's the analogy I use is that, you know, she would always be drawn to people who she thought that she could help. And uh, it's countless. The art aside from that was great. I mean, she was a great artist, but she was more than just an artist. She was a, like an awesome person. She was, I, I wrote a, a note in one of the cards for her and uh, I always call her my second wife. She was just a little bit too old, and I was just a little bit too young. But I ended up with the right person. But uh, in a different time, she would have been the one. That woman could dance. So uh, she loved music. I have to say that she wasn't great at carrying a tune, but she loved music. She loved, and she had great rhythm. And when, so going out sometimes and going dancing in Eau Claire was to stand back and just watch this woman rock she could move and and was happy she was pretty happy all the time but she was especially happy when when she was dancing so i have fond memories and images of her on her feet with her that red hair um, 
uh, with her dancing. Uh, I was thinking of another time, though, one morning when we were walking early and I left my house to meet up with her and it was still dark and this great big flash of light, not, not a, as fast as a flash, went across the sky. And I thought, what in the world is that? And, and then I thought immediately, I thought, oh no, Lori has seen this. She has already asked these aliens to come and get us. And, and when I saw her, I said, you did, didn't you? And she said, yeah, I thought this would be a good opportunity for us to have a space adventure. We found out later it was the, it was the shuttle and that's what we were seeing. But I knew she was going to invite us whoever to come and get us and I said I'm not ready to go I don't want to go but she did she was ready she just had a wonderful imagination and zest for life and zest for adventure um, there was no stopping her she was really encouraging and whenever she had an opportunity to my our, our children to I, and I witnesses with other kids with young people the Banbury uh, thing was, was, to me, a huge act of encouragement to young artists. Good, bad, and indifferent. I mean, she just wanted to encourage people in the arts. That, that you set a standard rather than live to a standard? I mean, I, I suspect that your stuff, your art out there, set the standard for what other art and even the other mediums in Eau Claire or Chippewa Valley needed to live up to. For glass, I think I did. Yeah, not for uh, painting or uh, any of those mediums. I can do it. I mean, I had a good sh I've had put on painting shows and usually mm -hmm. sold a few, mm -hmm. which is weird in itself to sell paintings. People, the Arn Allen Servos, you're not selling much. I used to hang out down at that little Burger King where the cop shop was for mm -hmm. a while, I think. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of kids that would go in there and draw. There were I don't think I went in there with it or wasn't at least one of these young men drawing. And most of them looked like they had been in trouble or needed somebody to come along and be their friend in an important way or something. And most of them were very good. They learned to draw out of comic books. And I just my son was a comic book kid. I just kind of I've always liked the comic book boys, and most of them have really interesting stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, but I wanted to meet some of them. I wanted them to say, "Oh, you know, this is old lady that's an artist," and but I wanted them to listen to me because I thought I could give them some good advice. And a couple of them are doing. We've got four or five artists in town now that are doing professional com comic books, and and doing good jobs and most of them are able to do it here mm -hmm. and mailed in the work and I definitely think that the comic book kids a lot of them get in trouble they don't have any supervision from parents at all they hang around together somebody gets an apartment and they're all hanging out together and they're young and they're doing dope and if somebody was this close maybe to them. Somebody had cared. Mm -hmm. They were well, going to do dope. Okay, I'm not going to tell you not to do dope, but I am going to tell you not to do it until after you get your studies done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just think you just got to be smart about that kind of stuff. Did art let you get into some people? I mean, closer to people? I mean, cut through some of their, you know, I mean, I know that people who are in trouble, they have their wall. Mm -hmm. Did art break that down? Yes. Matter of fact, there was rarely any. And uh, so I, I feel like me being an artist definitely opened doors for me with these people. I hope so. There was a fellow that was moved, another guy that moved in and he had a screen printing shop and he was in the building. And he just walks up one day and he hugs me and gives me this great big pickup hug. And I'm kind of like, who are you? you know? <laughs> and found out that he, I was the person that talked him into opening the script. But he said it was six or seven years ago. But I, I met you in, I can't even remember where he said, someplace down around where Benny Haas was. Problems go away or problems get turned into something, you know, that 
gives you something to work with. Well, when Brother Brian, you know what I mean when I say Brother Brian? He's the guy I gave my business to. Yes, okay. Um, he put on a lot of art shows and things too. And he put on a show one time that was behind Benny Haha's, in that it, there's an alley back there. And he said, Would you? Be interested in being in it? And I said, sure, I think that would be fun. Well, I was the only artist there that was over 25 years old. And that's how you make friends. I mean, go around, talk to them all, have your work there, not be uppity. And, and that's the other thing. You you have stayed very connected, obviously, with, with the art community. I mean, you're embedded in it. I mean, you are a part of all the other mediums. Alan is a is a water paints or a, yeah. a painting medium, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, it, and David Caridori. David, yeah. Yeah, he's like my kid. <laughs> but I, I really, he, he comes over and he picks something up and he studies it and then he walks a little ways and he puts that down and he picks something else up. Walks around studying and then he puts that down somewhere else. When he leaves, you can retrack every step he took through the house by what was picked up and moved where. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, I just, he's great. Yeah. If you weren't a part of your community, be it art, be it life, whatever. One time there was a, a young lady, I have to say waif because that's what she looked like. She was probably 11 or 12. And I might have, might have told you the story someday because it always makes me kind of cry. This girl walks in and she's walking around looking at all the paintings and everything and so I start talking to her and getting to know her and we were, the front of my store where, and where all the windows were that showed everything was filled with gravel. I don't like the dust obviously, I'm not into house cleaning and so, um, and I threw some of those glass, those glass blobs into the, in with the gravel to give it a little sparkle and um, she, she was talking and she said, I don't expect anything. I said, you don't, you know, you don't expect anything. Here's this kid, 11 or 12, she doesn't expect anything. So I start getting her to talk and she stays for a couple of hours and talks about, you know, her life, which sounded pretty, pretty rough. And so I picked out three of those marbles, glass things, and I gave them to her and I said, I know this is hard to believe, but these are magic. And you think of things over the next few years that are very, very important that you want to go in a certain way. Like you want to re you really want to get an A on this test. It's really important you studied hard. You just start rubbing these little stones and things will send out positive energies for this. And so she left and I never saw her again until about five or six years ago and I was in Banbury Place and I was walking down the uh, railroad tracks that used to be there yeah. and I see this person coming down the other way and she just kind of makes a beeline for me and I thought I knew her but I wasn't sure. She walks up to me and stands in front of me every time and she pulled out these three pieces of glass from her pocket. She says, you know what? You're right. And I just, I just said, boy, sometimes you just have to talk to people just a little bit and show that you care a little bit and we're better. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody really cared. And that's what I felt like this little girl needed the most was somebody caring that she even had a future. So I had a number of those people, and some of them that would hang out in the shop were really smart people. My living room group, the group of, there are six of us, and we have been meeting for 14 years every Sunday, at one Sunday a month. And uh, so they, they come down, come down, a couple of them have moved to the cities, and we're, we're still meeting, but um, have come down and wash the inside of the house and I mean even all the walls and everything just amazed me and uh, 
They're very interesting uh, adventure prom women. Very varied in their career paths and um, just a good having having such a group together for for so long is really an amazing thing. I think strong women, interesting women, seem to be very important for you. I mean, that's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. It might sound kind of trite, but I know some of your conversations you really light up. I mean, talking about the nuns over in. At the Christine Center. Yeah, you know, and, but just the fact that there's strong, independent women uh, is a very important aspect mm -hmm. of you. Yeah, well, I've always thought uh, equality was a very important thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe someday we'll get there. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, the Christine Center is a meditation center outside. Willard, Wisconsin. I call them my renegade nuns because they don't care what I think or what I do. And, um, and I really don't think they do because they really are renegade nuns. I did seven windows for, their, for the chapel that's out there. And after we did it, I had done the chakra centers. And the chakra centers are the centers on your body that people that deal with energy uh, believe in, heal with, and various other things. and We did them in the colors of the chakras. And then we got this new bishop down in Las, in Las Vegas, I almost said, in the cross. And he was going to come up and bless their church. And they wanted to figure out exactly what they were going to say, that this, what the chakra centers were when he came. <laughs> And I don't know what it was, but they said that there's a series of things that are about seven, seven scriptures or seven of this or seven of that. And they picked one and told them that's what it was. I don't remember what they told them, but it worked out fine. Mm -hmm. For someone who doesn't do religion per se, how do you? Th how come you? Your work is so acceptable and considered wonderful in a church setting. I mean, you do very well I mean, with the Unitarians, the Catholics, the Lutherans, and whatever other churches you've been in. I mean, how do you, how do you make it work for a religious institution when that's not necessarily where you come from? I don't think you need to come from there to tell the story. I mean, I can tell stories about things that aren't necessarily my stories. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that... But your art's pretty personal. And, yeah. And so, I mean, there's a lot of you in your art. And so how do you how do you blend that? What I do is I talk to people about what they want. And then I do four or five drawings of possibilities. With this particular one, I gave them about 10 possibilities. Mm -hmm. And they didn't pick the ones I wanted them to pick. <laughs> but... <clears throat> But they all love them, and it's their chapel, and mm -hmm. so that's important. You've been kind of trying to push the city into letting you be a part of the community on one project. Which, and that, which one's that? The Phoenix Park mm -hmm. sculpture. Yeah. And that hasn't happened, I mean... It's not going to happen. Okay. I've got it, it all drawn and, and measured, and I know that um, Mitch Piper is has all the drawings. He wants me to give him names of a whole bunch of rich people, but <laughs> I don't hang out with a whole bunch of rich people, so I'm not, I can't, can't make a long list for him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your pieces at Mayo, where they're at, at the Cancer Center, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, but you, you've got your own art here at home, you know. Well, and I still have a lot in the studio. Yeah. But a lot of the art I'm going to be giving to friends, and then the rest I'll just do leave in the studio mm -hmm. so that uh, the guy I gave it to has more an easier way of making it because mm -hmm. I really want it to live on mm -hmm. yeah well well you know here we're talking about commercial decision and you know practical decisions and everything but I know over the years our conversations I mean there, there's a real personal bond between you and your art and oh. you and your and absolutely everything. it's it's a very passionate thing I mean it wasn't it's easy to say it was commercial, but I mean, there's a passion and it shows in your work. 
yeah, well, the passion for my art, I still felt like I was, I was still making art. And then I started making the sculptures, and they got, that got really more exciting for me. Mm-hmm. So I did well, hundreds of sculptures, and then I've got a, a, thousand, a thousand windows since I've started. Yeah. I've got three of those 400 uh, shots in each, one of those little fat books, and you can get 400 pictures in one, so I've got mm-hmm. two and a half of those filled. So I've been really busy. Yeah. And those are your own designs, I'd yeah. say. I mean, I know you've I done some where, you, where people have asked you maybe to recreate something, but, but for the most part, it's all your design. I mean... Yeah, they're all my designs. Yeah, a, a flower is still a flower, but, it, but from Lori's eyes. Right. And, uh, yeah. and so it's always been amazing to me how you can see a flower so many different ways. Yeah. But that's the artist, right? Well, yeah, it's how you see it, how you want to do it, definitely. Mm-hmm. Now, most of my work was commission work, and if people wanted, say, oh, well, my wife, say you're getting a present for your wife, and she loves lilies and roses, so would you, would you make up a few designs for me using lilies and roses? And so I'd make up probably four or five designs using and and show them show the drawing to to the client, and the client would uh, pick the one they want, and I'd make it for them. Mm-hmm. So, and it's interesting; it goes through periods. You know, like I went through a few years where arts and crafts, everybody was getting arts and crafts designs, and which is fun because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful design direction. And, and in Wisconsin, being the home of Frank Lloyd Wright, mm-hmm. then it just all worked mm-hmm. really well. I like that a lot. Um, one year, and not since that year, nor after that year, have I done a dog. One year, I did five dogs. <laughs> so, I mean, it just funny things like that have happened. Mm. So, and I, so what, what of your art, I mean, we talked, I was over at the GOAT talking to Ryan, and I said, so if there's a question you wanted to ask Lori, what would it be? And he said, again, we know Lori is uh, stained glass, we know her as the artist in Eau Claire who, who has set the standards and everything, but what's Lori's other passions? What, what, what makes Lori go besides stained glass art. Well, I'm a little bit old for it now, <laughs> but <laughs> much of my sugar am. <laughs> uh, my passions now. Well, because I have cancer and I probably don't have more than three months right now, mm-hmm. uh, being able to make contact with people that I've fallen in love with around here is very important. Except what I'm finding now is I'm homebound a lot. Mm-hmm. And people come and get me all the time and give me rides places and things, which helps tremendously. But I really, I miss running around. I want to go do stuff. And, and uh, tonight, for instance, is the uh, improv group at the House of Rock. Well, I used to do improv. I love doing improv. I remember when you start were part of starting that, and yeah. it was just something you were really... Yeah, well, and I was the oldest person. I'm in my late 60s, and they're all in their 30s and early 40s. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the go word of, of every day was, Laurie, Laurie looks for a chair and falls into it when she dies. <laughs> so that's <laughs> no broken bones, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. That was so fun, and they're still going great guns. They're just doing it one night a week now, and but there's two groups now, so yours yours has splintered off into two. Well, they, there's maybe even three then because Memorial has a great oh, okay. group, okay. and the instructor at Memorial has three students that have gone on to Chicago and are doing it in Chicago. Okay, so she's it's exciting, mm-hmm. very exciting to see that. 
But then Eau Claire's, a, Eau Claire's on fire right now. It's got stuff going. It's got stuff going. There's a new energy everywhere. There's new things happening, new buildings being built, wonderful young people that have gotten successful and coming back. I haven't seen that before. Mm -hmm. So arts are better shape, less shape? I mean, It depends on what the referendum says today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether I'm going to be happy or really, really sad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I won't ask you one way or the other on that, I mean, unless you want to. But I'm totally proud of how I feel about it. Okay. Well, Claire needs art. It needs, it needs culture. People need to find out it's fun. Mm -hmm. All of these things are fun. You just have to do it. I've met so many people in this town that have never even been to the Arts Center. There's phenomenal things going on over there, and at at the Children's Theater and the um, Grand Theater, I mean, they do so many unusual things over there. You know, my favorite thing are the drag queen shows, but... <laughs> Your development of the community aspect of arts is a pretty important thing. Yeah. And it's a good I've legacy, been, too. I've been real involved. I think so, too. I think so, too. And, and, and Eau Claire has so many wonderful people. I would tell young artists that are just getting started to draw as much as they possibly can. That if you can't draw well, even with all of the magic of, of uh, computers these days, don't rely on the magic of the computers. Rely on yourself. If you can draw well, you can learn the machines. If you can't, you can't. And it's not your drawing, it's a computer. And I would say, and number two, get involved with the community. It's your family. Go and work for Special Olympics. You're going to meet all kinds of people, you're going to meet all kinds of new friends, and a few of them are going to be your clients. So you not only meet nice people, they help you make a living. The smile and the laugh. <laughs> It really didn't matter who she was talking to or what mood they were in. Um, if, if she felt that they needed a hug or a smile, she would just do it. She would just walk up to them and, and hug them and smile, and she would see whether or not that they were upset, like I said, or sad or bothered or whatever mood they were in. She just wanted to make sure they were, they were happy, especially when they were around her. So even if it was just for that moment in time, she wanted to make them happy. And uh, that's the way I've always felt about her. Um, even during her hard times, uh, I always felt I could talk to her about anything. And, you know, I've been at the hospital with her several times. I've been over at her house when she was pretty immobile. She couldn't really do a whole lot at that point in time. And, uh, we would just hang out and we would talk uh, about all sorts of things. I mean, the studio was always a, a main topic and the arts obviously were main topics, but we talked about everything, you know, as far as friendships, relationships, uh, family, uh, what's going on with my other job, what's, you know, it, it, it we, we talked about everything. Um, and it was always a good talk. It was always a good talk, uh, no matter what it was about. Um, I always felt like a weight had been off my shoulder if I was going through a hard time. And in leaving, I always kind of felt bad, like, oh my gosh, I'm bringing out all my problems right now this day, you know, and maybe I had a bad day. And thinking about what she's going through, I'm like, wow, man, now I feel a little bit like, I feel a little bad. And I think of my problems versus her problems, and then everything would just be kind of more uplifted. And But that's who she was. I mean, no matter what she was going through, no matter if she was just laying in bed all day because she couldn't move because she was in too much pain or she was sick, she still wanted to hear what was happening in my life, good or bad, and that was, to me, a, a true friend. She had called me up and said, Shell, let's take a trip. This will probably be the last time I'll be able to actively go around and see things. What do you want to do? And I was just blown away. I was like, well, <laughs> you know, what do you do? So I. So we decided that we, we like the, the desert, and I, I'm kind of a, a space head. I really like space. and So in Arizona, they had Meteor Crater, and they had the Lowell Observatory, and they had the Grand Canyon. Grand, Lori had never really seen the Grand Canyon, even though she painted it a lot. 
So it was, it was really special for us to get together and meet in Las Vegas. And we'd, you know, we'd go downstairs and I'd find my mother flirting with the, with the bellboy or the doorman. And <laughs> of course, they were flirting back. So, you know, and being able to spend time with her and just in the car and be able to look over and see her there, you know, and the amazement of the Grand Canyon really had an effect on her. She was like just amazed that it was so big as it was because she always pictured her kind of smaller. And being able to share that time with her was just amazing for me. You know, I really was able to connect with her. We had meaningful conversations and talked about her past and decisions that she had made and that type of thing. And explaining the, the, the decisions that she made to me brought a clarity to my life that I didn't have before. And that was really special for me. <laughs> when Lori, before Lori was even diagnosed and she was ill, we knew she was ill, she knew she was ill, we didn't know yet what, um, but she was be beginning to take some medications that were pretty serious. And it seemed to me that that was a, something that, a, a way that maybe I could help her. Uh, to just kind of take charge of the medications to make sure that they were always there, that she was taking them when she needed them, and so forth. So she very generously let me in uh, to that experience. And three years later, we just went on that journey together. And it turned into um, me going to doctor's appointments with her, sitting with her through chemo treatments. Um, and I have to say, we both learned a lot. We learned a lot about her illness. We learned about a lot about um, the medical uh, treatments. Um, we shared the wonderful experience of the medical staff, her doctor, uh, the nurses. Um, we, but we went on that journey together. We often said we wished that we didn't have to go on that journey, but there we were, and we were a pretty good team. Um, and I, and I thank her from the core of my being for letting me help her in that way because it was a gift and a blessing to me. She always said it was to her. So maybe, you know, she didn't, she was a truth teller, so I'm going to accept that it was, but it definitely was a two-way blessing. Um, I will forever be grateful for the experience that I got to have. Um, to help my friend through her illness and through the end of her life. My family, my sister and my mom and I made her a mobile of a thousand paper cranes and that's all I did. It was nothing but she loved it and she talked about it all the time and I, <laughs> it was something so simple for me to do that I was surprised it got so, so much reaction from her and she hung it in her house with a light underneath it and it was she was so she appreciated it so much and I, I would have done anything everyone I made I was thinking of her and hoping that she would get better and she she did she said she, she told me it worked because it <laughs> she had a few more years than she was expecting when she got but for whatever reason so do you mind do you mind talking about the cancer at all no I'm very at ease with talking about okay. it okay so so what it what what happened? Where, where'd you, what'd you wind up with and how's it going? Or what, what's the, well, what's I, the thing about cancer for you? Uh, well, right now I have about maybe four months at the most, uh, which is kind of interesting because it's another element when you've been given an end time than when you're just kind of going along expecting to be okay all the way along. Um, I thought and had been being treated for lead poisoning for three years. Um, and that's very uncomfortable. And the process feels a lot like advanced bone cancer, only I didn't know that and I just kept going with the lead thing. And then it was, I just had too much pain and so I started really seeking doctors out and I ended up going to see and I can't remember, it's a, a, a man that's a hospitalist, but he's like half chiropractor and half uh, regular doctor. He said, I want to have this 
these x-rays taken. And so some people took some x-rays and they sent me to somebody else. And then they said they wanted to send, wanted to send some stuff to Mayo, and they did. And then they sent us up to, or me up to Mayo. And my, uh, what, do I, what do I call Mary? Mary's my advocate. Mm -hmm. I met with my wonderful, I have an advocate, a woman who has spent almost every day with me for three years. I mean, she's gone away and come back, but I mean almost every day. So she's really been my savior because her memory hasn't gone. Mm -hmm. My memory is, needs a lot to be desired these days. So then we found out it was that it, I have breast only bone cancer. There is a, a cancer that doesn't come along very much and it can't be found with the mammogram because um, there's no mass. So mammograms just, it just floats around and doesn't take a picture of anything. So when they finally found it, I was in stage four. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, you know, you're, you are going to probably be dead in about two weeks. So that was a bolt. And then they, they gave me this doctor and he's, and that is amazingly good with pharmaceuticals. He's an oncologist, but he's a pharmaceutical and a blood doctor. Anyway, so he pulled me out of all of this. I was going to say, that wasn't two weeks ago. That was how long ago? That was three years ago. Yeah. I know, I was given two weeks and here it is three years and I'm still here and feel a little guilty about it sometimes. <laughs> And everybody's been expecting me to keel over any time now, and I keep hanging on. And keep hanging and, on. Yeah, but you know, people are going to get tired of bringing me cups of coffee and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Does it help that you think there's some there's more to come? I don't have this any whole doubt. process. Yeah, but, but I mean, can you imagine trying to do this without thinking that there was more to come? Would it, would this be harder? Do you think? Or does that make it easier? Or is it? It makes it harder or easier. Um, I, my belief system now is that good things are going to happen to me. I'm going to learn and see and be and float around the whole universe and I'm going to love it. So that won't be bad. And if there is no more, there is no more. What difference does it make? Mm -hmm. The religion maybe is not important to you, but there's a very definite spirituality of all Very order. definitely. Yeah, and so what about, what about that? Spirituality is wonderful. It only gives you enlightenment. It only gives you an interesting way to go mm -hmm. and think. And thinking that everything is fascinating and starting a, a way of not being a human being, I bet you I can learn a lot faster, mm -hmm. probably be smarter, which would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, so I really think that's that's what it is about. It's about learning and being part of things. Maybe I will come back. I kind of like to be an astrophysicist that's an artist on the side. <laughs> no, there you go. I can't live without drawing, so. <laughs> is it like folks told you? I mean, there is a certain level of freedom uh, upon acceptance or Well, or I, no, I never or? really had trouble accepting it. It's always been, it's always been easy. Um, I'm very, very curious about what happens, and there's so many possibilities, mm -hmm. and I expect them all to be good ones, because mm -hmm. I just don't think that this planet could be this beautiful and this universe could be so immense that there isn't endless things that could be going on. So, so you don't think this is it? No. There, there's more to come? Oh, yes, much more to come. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, you figure if you're going to die, and death is for an eternity. You got to fill all that time up. You know, you think, well, you could go down to the bottom of the ocean and find out why those little fish light up. Yeah. Why in the world do those little how do those little fish light up? Well, you start studying it, and you're totally captivated by by how outlandishly wonderful it is, and you start studying it. And then you bump into something else on that little fish and think, oh my God, I think I better start studying that. Mm -hmm. You figure, if you want to, you have that happen 
all through the universe, it's an eternity. And if the universe isn't an eternity, I don't know what it is. So many people are talking about her legacy, um, which I think is testimony to how much she touched people, how many people she touched, and how importantly she touched them. I think, I think a lot of people pass from this life and people don't talk about their legacy. But she made such an impact in our community. She changed it. Uh, her, her being here changed it. And I suspect we all change our community in, in, in ways that we'll never know. But hers are a lot known the impact on the arts community and her involvement. She threw herself into the city. Uh, she got involved in city committees and, you know, she just, she just was, uh, she just saw potential. Uh, she always saw potential. So her legacy, I, I think, is, is nothing but positive. And I think also she passed with projects still in mind. She wanted to do a big project for the confluence and she had a wonderful idea and she didn't have time to do it, but she had those stars in her eyes. She just had those dreams always. And so I think, I think a, one of the legacies that I take kind of personally from her is, is always be awake. Just be seeing what's going on around you and, and seeing ways that you might, um, through acts of generosity, acts of kindness, acts of compassion, um, acts of creativity, make your community a better place, make your neighborhood a better place, make your friendships better. She modeled that every single day, every single day. I, I know she had tough times. I know she had times when she, when she was maybe even a little bit scared, but she bounced back to her default position, which was optimistic, happy, um, and loving, and, and very giving. Her legacy will always be in the art that she brought to the town and the change that she had with the art crawl and, and the art commission and all that kind of stuff. And that's obvious, and that will be around. But I think the biggest legacy will be in the, in the, in the children that she's nurtured and the people that she's helped change their lives just by a simple conversation or a smile. And one thing I've noticed being back and having everyone gather around but us and support us is, is the amount of change that she had in everyday lives. And I think that will be her true legacy as far as her memory goes, the friends and the people that she affected so well and the love she shared with everybody so freely I think was probably going to be her legacy as far as nurturing that in others and seeing that it's okay to live that way. So, is that, yeah? Yeah, I think that's probably her legacy will be the people that she helped so much. I think Lori's legacy is so mixed too because she was involved in so many things in the community. Uh, it wasn't, people think of Lori as the stained glass artist, the, the stained glass lady or whatever, but she was so many other things. I mean, what uh, she promoted the arts. She was a shrewd business person. She, um, she knew how to work a crowd. Uh, her smile was a big part of it, but she also never shirked what she thought was her duty, which was to the community. She would, she would never say anything negative about anyone. And I love that about her because so many people do, or you just can't help it sometimes, but she would always just say, I'm not gonna say anything negative. And I try to remember that when, you know, when I might be thinking that way about someone and just try to be positive and see the good in, in everyone, and like she did. I mean, I'm not as good at it as she is, but you know, maybe someday. I think basically every city needs a Lori Beasy in their town. Uh, just motivates everyone. It motivates people to do positive things, uh, whether it to be helping the homeless or trying to raise funds for other projects uh, to help the needy out in some way, shape, or form. She's done that, and in learning that, uh, you know, I've I've done things as far as shows go that are kind of on the same track. I have a dog art show that I put on every September, hosted through Tangled Up and Hue, and. 
It's basically to help support the Humane Societies or Bob's House of Dogs. It's anything to help bring money towards somebody who needs it, whether it be a person, whether it be an animal, whether it be anything. Um, she was always focused on helping out others one way, shape, or form. So, yeah, I, th I think, like I said, I just think everybody needs a Lori Beasy in, this, in their town because I think it'll be a lot better. I, I heard somebody make a remark that they didn't, they'd never been to Alaska, but they just liked knowing it was there. And I kind of felt that way about Lori. It was just comforting to know that she was there and that she, you know, was going to be there. And I like to think she felt the same way. I would tell young artists that are just getting started to draw as much as they possibly can. That if you can't draw well, even with all of the magic of of uh, computers these days. Don't rely on the magic of the computers. Rely on yourself. If you can draw well, you can learn the machines. If you can't, you can't. And it's not your drawing, it's a computer. And I would say, and number two, get involved with the community. It's your family. Go and work for Special Olympics. You're going to meet all kinds of people, you're going to meet all kinds of new friends, and a few of them are going to be your clients. So you not only meet nice people, they help you make a living. I have found that um, having a lot of friends and has, I, I've said a lot of times that I really believe it. I feel like for the last couple of, or two, three years or so, I've been wrapped in love. I've really just been wrapped in the people come and take care of me all the time. I mean, I don't go a day where there isn't one person. And thank goodness I've only had one day where there was 19 people. And my belief system now is that good things are going to happen to mm -hmm. me. I'm going to learn and see and be and float around the whole universe and I'm going to love it.